let's go ahead and pray and then we'll get into the series that we're starting today. Did God really say that? Father, we thank you and praise you. What a day it is to celebrate the fact that your son not only died, but more importantly, rose again from the dead. We're here to celebrate that fact today that you loved us so much that you would send your one and only begotten son to die in our place for our sins that we might have life. And Lord, we give you everything today. We are here to honor you with our songs, with our finances, with this time of worshiping in the word. Would you use it to touch us, to change us, to bring us revelation, maybe even today and in the weeks ahead about things that you may or may not have said in your word that we might take for granted and think sometimes is in the Bible, but maybe isn't really in the Bible. Lord, would you reveal those truths to us today in a way that it would impact us, change us, transform us, and and give us the grace to live this Christian life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So we are kicking off a new series today. I hope you'll come back next week and enjoy it even more. We're kicking off a series that we're calling, Did God Really Say That? There's a lot of things in life that go around as one-liners and different sayings that maybe we attribute to God or attribute to the Bible, but are they really from the Bible? I believe in what today's message is really centered around is, what do you believe and what you believe actually really matters? In most cases, it matters, I should say. Maybe you saw this picture of a dress on Facebook some time ago. Maybe they have it, they can put it on there. So some of you, um, this was bi a really big rage about a year ago. So how many of you think that is more like a blue and gray dress? If it is, raise your hand. Okay, how many of you, I think the other color's like gold and something. How many of you don't see it as blue and gray? You people are all wrong. Whoever was the second group was wrong. That is a blue and gray dress. There was other ones that came out with shoes that were similar that are optical illusions. But guess what? Whether you believe it to be a blue or gray dress or not, it's not all that important, is it not? Now there's other things in life where it is pretty important. I read a recent news article about a man that said that he could speak to and tame lions by himself. Now, belief and action are sometimes two different things, but apparently he really believed this in his head. He scaled a 20 foot wall, ended up going into a lion's den and attempted to speak to and talk to lions and it did not end all that well for him. The lion ended up eating him, it was not good. So what you believe about lions and your ability to talk about talk, and talk to and control lions kind of really matters, right? Now, none of y'all are about to go to the Jacksonville Zoo today, I hope, and go over there and try to talk to lions. It is Easter Sunday. Just don't do it in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen? Say, don't do it. Don't do it, right? So some of the things that we believe obviously really, really matter, and some of them have consequences that can last in this life and into eternity. I would say that the number one most important thing that we have to come to an understanding on whether is whether or not we believe that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. Do we believe that he was born of a virgin? Do we believe that he lived a sinless life? Do we believe that he died on a cross? Do we believe that he rose again three days later? Do we believe that if we surrender our lives to him that we can be saved and become part of the family of God? Some of you believe those things, others may not. It's okay, we are glad that you're here today. You see, sometimes there's a big difference between what the world says is true and what the word of God says is true. Would you agree? Sometimes there's a big difference, there's a chasm. Let me be very blunt from the beginning. There's a question that Jesus ended up asking his disciples and I believe it's the most important question that each of us have to answer at some point in our life. He asked his disciples one day, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Are you of that group that I described earlier that believe all the statements that I just talked about? Jesus is the son of the living God who died on the cross and rose again on the third day. He was born of a virgin. He died in our place for our sins that we might have life. I'd say many of you do. You're allowed to raise your hand right now. You can, if you believe that, you can raise your hand. It is okay to raise your hand in church. You believe that to be true. If you don't, I pray that you would approach this day with an open mind. I pray that you would hear out what I have to say. I'm so glad that you're here. I pray that God would impress upon you by his Holy Spirit the truths that I believe to be true, but I don't want you to take my word for it. 
I don't even want you to take the person who invited you's word for it. I want you to take Jesus's life as an example, as you'll see in just a few moments. May he touch each of our hearts and each of our minds. So what are some of those things that we believe about God that may or may not be true? If I am a sincere person, if I'm a good person, then I've got a ticket to heaven, right? All you got to do is be a good person. Don't many in our generation believe that? Don't many in our generation believe that all roads lead to heaven? Have you heard anybody said that? I'm a good person. There's no way that God would send me to hell. Well, he doesn't send us to hell. He rescues us from hell to be more precise, right? But there's these things that people believe to be true, but are they actually true? See, Jesus in his word says that that's not true. He says that all roads don't lead to heaven. In fact, he says in Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are what? Few. So glad there's a few of you in this room today that believe that to be true, right? It is a pretty big and broad road, but man, what you believe really matters if Jesus is who he says he is. Because if you put statements out there like that, that are bold, there's other things that people say about Jesus, that he's a good man, right? He's a prophet. But guess what? If he says things and makes claims about being God and he's not God, then he's not a very good man, is he? That would mean he's a liar or that would mean he's crazy, right? But I believe he's not. I believe he truly is who he said he is and who he was and he demonstrated that on earth and in heaven. Some other sayings that we'll explore in weeks ahead are like, God wants us to be happy. How many of you believe that? Well, sort of, maybe, we'll see. You better come back next week, come on Jesus. Maybe there's some more important things than our happiness that he's after, right? God won't give me more than I can handle. I said, now you're all getting nervous. Like, I'm not raising my hand. He's going to call me out. I'm, I'm just, it's, it's not going to happen. Or there's some that are even more nuanced that you hear at places like maybe a funeral, right? Oh, they're in a better place now. Is that what the Bible really says for everyone? Or God just got another angel. How many of you heard that, right? Is that true? Maybe, maybe not. You're going to have to come back to be continued next week. You have to come back for those. I hope you come back and see that. So our, the question really becomes, are these just feel good statements that we want to put out there so that we feel good? Or are they really biblical truths? Or are they the truth at all, whether you believe the Bible to be true or not? Are they true or not? Because if they're true, what we believe really matters. I'm going to say that a few times today. What we believe really matters. So let's get to the start and the crux of today's question about what you believe in particular, what do you believe about Jesus and does it matter? There's a scene in Matthew chapter six, starting in verse 13 that says, now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say that the son of man is? And some said, John the Baptist, others said, Elijah, and others said, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? I believe that to be the most important question that we ever need to answer in life. That's the one that I brought up earlier. I believe it's vitally important how we answer that particular question. He starts very generally when he opens up there. He's like, what do people say that I am or who that I am? What do, they, what do the people say about me? And then all of a sudden he shifts that question really quickly and specifically and asks, but who do you say that I am? Isn't it like that out there in the world? When you say that you believe in God, it doesn't really ruffle too many people's feathers, does it? You say, I believe in God. In fact, it's a pretty popular thing to do sometimes, right? You see, when sports people go out and get their big victory, all of a sudden they're giving God all the glory, right? Those people that are out there in Hollywood that are God haters half the time, all of a sudden they get the Emmy and they hold up the enemy. Thank God. The M M oh, I said enemy instead of Emmy, right? So they hold up the enemy, right? And they say, to God be the glory, right? They give all credit to God. And you could say God all you want in life, right? But then you bring in that name Jesus. So, ooh, it starts to get real, real quick, right? All of a sudden, people start to get really upset. If you're like Chick-fil-A, people start protesting against you, right? 
Anybody getting hungry for Chick-fil-A today? It's closed on Sundays. Come on, Jesus. That's the only day I crave Chick-fil-A. I don't know why. I don't know why it happens to be that way. Right? Like, Let's go to chick Oh, man, they're closed, right? But you claim the name of Jesus rather than claiming just God, and all of a sudden, people get really upset. Why is that? Here's the statements that Jesus began to make that got people really upset. John 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So he talks about that right there. Believe in God. It's okay. You can believe in God. Don't let your heart be troubled. No problem there. Everybody agrees at this point. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go and prepare. Why would I have told you that I would go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas, the doubter says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus says to them, I am the way, the truth and the life. And nobody comes to the father except through me. I am the way, the truth and the life. And nobody comes to the father except through me. There's different ways in which you could paraphrase that and, and good or bad. And you could say it very meanly, or you could say it very nicely. I believe you say, I'm the way, the true and the truth and the life. And nobody comes to the father except through me. He's the truth. He is the, the way he's making these claims that are very exclusive that would begin to get people very upset, right? If you're claiming to be God, if you're excluding certain people by the way in which you're saying it, this is what gets people upset even in our own generation, even as they did in his in that day, right? So he's saying that the path is narrow, the way is narrow, right? Believe in him. He's saying that he is the way. He's the one who takes us down the path. Guess what? That statement that a lot of our friends believe that all paths lead to heaven, is he not debunking that right there? That's why they get upset. Because all paths do not lead to heaven, right? There is one way to heaven. What you believe really matters. What you believe really matters. As I shared earlier, a lot of people will also say that Jesus is a good man, that Jesus was a prophet. But if you claim to be God and are not God, then you are a lunatic liar or Lord. There's only three things that you could be in the midst of that, right? So if he's crazy, should we be following him? You're allowed to answer. This is a charismatic church. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> if he's a lunatic, should you be following him? If he's a liar, should you be following him? If he's a Lord, should you be following? Yes, you're supposed to say yes to that one. You're supposed to say yes, it's okay. You'll get this. I realize a few of your guests here today. It's all good. We are so glad that you're here. So why did he say this? Think about this for a moment. Every religion does have some measure of truth in it, right? Every religion pretty much has some measure of truth, but here Jesus is saying that he is the truth. He is the truth, right? So Buddhists believe in reincarnation, right? There may be aspects of Buddhism that are true, but they believe in reincarnation, which we as Christians believe to not be true, right? Hindus believe in a multi-God peace, that they have karma, right? Muslims believe in Allah. They believe in no idols. They believe in religious devotion to works that get you into heaven. It's a works-based theology in most other religions. Atheists believe that there is no God. There's actually very few people that believe that there is no God, but atheists believe that there is no God. New Age, I have no clue what they believe. I have no clue what they believe, but they believe weird stuff. There'll be like some weird stuff. So when someone says it doesn't matter what you believe, all you have to do is be a good person, I have to lovingly disagree with them because that is not what the Bible says, that is not what Jesus says, but I have to love, lovingly disagree with them because what we believe really what? A few of you are listening, come on, I'll take it. How about you guys back there in overflow? Hope you're having a good time back there. You see, the world and the devil does everything he can to muddy the waters, does he not? He continues to make things more and more different even in our own generation. See, when I grew up, boys used to be boys and girls used to be girls. Come on, Jesus, right? <laughs> Marriage was between a man and a woman. 
Phones actually had cords. Come on, Jesus. You'd listen to records. Anybody remember records? We had records, the needles and the records. Some of you young people were like, what is that? What are you talking about? How many of you made your love, the person that you love, a mixtape back in the day? Come on, you have a mixtape. Y'all don't have the joy of a mixtape anymore. I guess you can do it on shuffle, whatever it might be. We even used maps and didn't have a GPS and somehow managed to get to places. I was talking to this, my daughter and son-in-law, he, he's not very adept at getting around, even with GPSs. I don't know why, but uh, I'm hoping he's not in here to hear that right now in Jesus' name. But, um, but we were telling him that we used to use maps and he was fascinated. He's like, you made it all the way to North Carolina with a map? And we're like, yes, we did. Back in the day, we had these maps. How, like, how did we meet? Like my wife lived in Hialeah and I lived in Miami Springs in South Florida and it was crazy. It was like a jungle down there at times, but somehow we knew how to meet each other. I don't even know how we did it back then. You actually had to pick up the phone with a cord on it, people. I mean, these were the days, the glory days before all this weird stuff happened, right? But today, if I want to identify as an African-American teenage woman or as a kangaroo for that matter, in some circles, People would be absolutely okay with that in our generation, right? Things have gotten just a little bit distorted. But guess what? Whether I believe that to be true or not, I'm still a middle-aged white guy in Jesus' name, and I can't dance for the life of me, so it's, it's all good, right? I'm so happy. Next week. That'll be next week. I got to practice that dance before next week. The devil can muddy the waters all he wants, but truth is still truth. Do you agree? Truth is still truth. Sadly, here's the deal. I think we as Christians often mess it up. And if you're one of those who are here today who would not claim the name of Jesus, who would not call yourself a Christian, um, I would ask you to not fully judge Christianity by us messed up Christians. We've got issues, we've got challenges. We admit it, we need help. We have a hope in this one who was perfect, but we are far from perfect. Our hope is in the one who is in who is perfect. So here's what I'm asking you to do this Easter. Yeah, come on, you can put your hands together, that is good. So here's how I wanna spend the rest of our time together. Um, here's what I'm asking you to do this Easter. Don't consider Christianity as you see it today. Don't even consider my claims. Don't consider what I'm saying to you based on the behavior of other Christians. Answer this question, who do you say that I am based on Jesus alone? I'm going to give you a few attributes of who he is and who he claimed to be. And I'm praying that it'll impact your heart in such a way that if you don't believe in him, that your heart will be soft and that you will come to a realization that he is truly the God of the universe. If you already believe in him, I pray that these things will reaffirm your faith and fire you up all over again. The first thing I would ask you to consider is the ministry of Jesus. Mark 2, 16. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance, the sinners to salvation. Jesus came for the sinners. He came for people like you and me. He didn't come for the righteous. He he came for that woman who was there that was a prostitute who was struggling and came and cried at his feet and washed the tears and dirt from his feet with the tears and with that perfume. Who does that? Many will die for a righteous man, but few will consider dying for someone who is a sinner, would they not, right? Man, consider the ministry of Jesus and who he came to save. Most other religions want you to earn by works. Most other religions come for those who already got all their stuff together. Jesus came for those of us who don't have our stuff together, right? That woman caught in adultery. The outcry of the religious was stone her. And Jesus says, no, forgive her. Does that give you some reassurance? that he is the one who came to save your life and offer forgiveness of sins. The second thing I would ask you to consider is the miracles of Jesus. 
There are far too many to go through. The Bible is replete with testimony after testimony of one person after another being healed, one person after another being set free, one person after another being delivered from demons. When has that ever happened? Only by Jesus, only by the power of the living God. Many of you who are here are walking miracles. Walking miracles. God super met your natural at some point and changed everything in your life. I am a walking miracle. I was one who was all about doing drugs, all about living for the things of this world, so caught up that I couldn't get out of it on my own power, crying out year after year, free, free me from this bondage of sin and death. And then one day Jesus came with a touch and said, you are delivered, you are set free. You no longer have to pursue those things. Those are no longer you. You don't have to live that way any longer. And let me tell you something, he just didn't remove that one thing from me. The Bible says, and I fully believe in my heart because it's by my experience, I am a new creature, I am a new creation. The old has passed away. I lived the first 26 years of my life for things that were the opposite of the word of God and who he is and who he was. And that day, that instant, that journey started on Easter day a few years before that, where I began to open up and explore this thing called Christianity. And then I ended up surrendering my life to Jesus. And then, man, everything became new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the miracle literally happened in my life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Has anybody been made new in this room here today? How about you in the overflow? How many of you have been made new back there? The last thing I would want you to consider is the resurrection of Jesus. And that's why we're here today. This is what's gonna bring our time together to a close. Let me share with you one of the main reasons in which I believe. One thing that we all need to understand and believe is that our God loves you, but he hates sin. He hates sin, but he loves you. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was born without sin. It gives him the right to die in our place for our sins as a perfect sacrifice that allows us to go into God's presence and become part of the family of God if we'll only believe and receive, right? What you believe really what? Matters. What you believe really matters. At that moment when creation was mocking the creator, when they beat him beyond recognition, when they laughed at him and spit at him and pulled his beard out and plucked it from his very face and he was there bleeding, he looks up to heaven and says, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Then he says, it is finished and the earth goes dark and the earth begins to rumble, a great earthquake happens, and the centurion, the Roman who was standing watch, surely says, surely this man is the son of God. One of the first witnesses to what happened, say witness. One of the first witnesses to what happened was a non-believer, a Roman soldier, whose first declaration upon seeing this act says, surely he is the son of God. Three days later, if you know the story, there's an empty tomb, is there not? That's why you're here today, I hope, right? Three days later, there was an empty tomb. <laughs> Acts 3.15 says, you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this, we are all witnesses. Say witness one more time. There were eyewitnesses to this event who wrote about it, not just in the Bible, but how many of you believe in history books? Some of you are shaking your head. I don't know if I believe in today's modern day history books to be completely honest. Old history books, <laughs> Old history books. there you go. But it wasn't written about just in the Bible. There were many other works that were written about that talk about this event by people who didn't even believe. They said, this event really happened. In fact, there's an old book I call it old in our generation, but it's called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, written by a guy who also wrote a book called More Than a Carpenter, who said that if you were to take Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and all the ancillary documents that surround it, you could convict him of being risen from the dead in a U.S. court of law. Think about that for a moment. You could convict him of rising from the dead in a U.S. court of law. 
Jesus really rose from the dead. He did. People who were believers talked about it. People who were unbelievers talked about it. People did everything they could to quench this, to try to kill believers. 70 AD, they wiped out all the Jewish people, moved them from those places. They wiped out everybody that they can, the Romans, right? They tried to do everything they could to extinguish Christianity, yet we're here today. We're still here today. Why are we here today? What do you believe? Do you believe he really is the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again? Guess what? There were doubters in the early days, even those who were close to him, right? Think about Thomas, who we mentioned earlier in that scripture. Thomas was Thomas the what? Some of y'all really are Christians and read your Bible. I love this. Thomas the doubter, right? Jesus had to come and show him the pierced hands, the pierced feet. He had to walk up to him. So Thomas is an eye witness to what he experienced. He saw all of this happen. So why would 11 untrained men end up dying for a lie? You tell me. Have to be, did, did a whole bunch of people die over Watergate? Did a whole bunch of people go and say, I'm going to go die for these causes? No. Why would 11, uh, how did 11 untrained men concoct such a story? There's no way that they could have. So go back to Thomas. There's a day where he's in India and he's proclaiming the gospel. He's talking about Jesus. He's telling people about his eyewitness account of what happened. And they tell Thomas, renounce Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He failed to renounce Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Why? Because he was an eyewitness to these accounts. He knew it to be true. He knew that to do anything else, to try to renounce Jesus as his Lord and Savior would be blasphemy. He would die for this cause. He would soon have a spear thrust through his body because he believed it to be true because he was there. He was an eyewitness to it, right? Guess what? All but one of the disciples ended up dying very gruesome, awful deaths. Some even flipped upside down and crucified. Why would they all die for a lie? They wouldn't. They died for the truth. They died for the truth. So today we can have great confidence in what we believe by putting all of these accounts together. For those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, may these things be assurances of your faith. For those of you who are considering the claims of Christ, I pray that God's doing something in your heart this very moment that's saying, wow, this stuff is real. Look at all the changed lives around you. There's a bunch of jacked up, messed up people sitting right next to you. I assure you. But they're better people because they've been transformed by the power of the living God, right? Some of you knew them before they got saved. So if we go back to the story, it begs the question that Jesus asked to those in the room that day. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? How would Peter answer that question when it was redirected from a larger group to a very specific one? Jesus looking him in the eyes. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. What say you this very day? Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Thank you so much for being here. Nobody looking around, try to keep all movement to a minimum if possible for just a moment. May these words not be mine, but be Jesus's this very day. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that he is? Who do you say that Jesus is? Everybody in this room, everybody online, everybody in the annex is faced with this question. We all need to answer it at some point in our life. And if what we believe really matters, this is a vital question that we need to answer because if Jesus truly is who he says he is and he is Lord and the path is narrow and he is the way, the truth and the life, he's here with an extended hand saying, who do you say that I am? He's looking at you face to face. He's looking at you eye to eye. He's wanting to guide you. He's wanting to direct you. He's wanting to lead you onto this narrow path. One that many have walked before by answering the question the way that Simon did, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, I know that many of you have already made that declaration, man, so happy for you. 
But maybe some of you who are here today have never taken the moment to say that. The Bible says that if we will believe on him and confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. We will be transformed. You will begin to become that new creation that I talked about. The old things will be passed away. Your sins will be forgiven. You'll be welcomed into the family of God, not into Journey Church. I'm talking about being welcomed into the family of God. Surely you'd be welcomed here as well. But man, you would have a relationship with the king of the universe, the creator of our very souls. His presence is here today and he'd love to welcome you into his family. So there's really two groups of people that I'd love to talk to today. If you've never made that declaration before and just feel in your heart that today's the day you want to declare that Jesus is Lord, you want to make a decision to live for him from this day forward and forevermore, I want to pray with you personally. And I want to celebrate that moment with you. Many in this room have already celebrated that moment and sometime in the past, it was the best day of their life. I know for me, it was the best day of my life and I would love to celebrate what I believe will be the best day of your life. Others of you, I believe your salvation is secure. I believe we don't lose our salvation, but maybe you've been walking your own path for a little while and today's the day you wanna come home. From this day forward, you wanna say, God, forgive me for walking my own way. I, I know that you've been waiting there with open arms for me to come home and today's the day I wanna rededicate my life to you. So if today's the day that you wanna dedicate or rededicate your life to Jesus, man, nobody here would do anything to embarrass you, but I certainly would love to pray with you. And in fact, everybody's heads bowed, eyes closed here in the annex online. But if that's you, would you do me a favor so I know who I'm praying with? If that's you, just raise your hand up real high right where you're at. Is that you, you wanna dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ? I see your hand back there, ma'am. Thank you, Lord. Is there others? I see your hand sitting down in the back right there. Thank you, Lord. If you're in the annex and you're raising your hand, praise God, we are so glad that you're here. Father, we come before you with those who have raised their hands and we celebrate today as believers in Jesus Christ. We know that you're standing before us this Easter Sunday saying, who do you say that I am? And Lord, together we declare that you are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, who died on a cross and rose again. Yes, you were born of a virgin. You died a sinner's death in our place for our sins, yet you lived a sinless life. You came that our sins might be forgiven, that we might be welcomed into the family of God. We believe that that is the truth. That is the truth. And today we surrender our hearts, our minds, our lives to you. We lay our sins at your feet and we ask you, oh God, to do what only you could do and remove them from us right now, this very moment. We surrender them to you and we walk out of here in newness of life as new creations, celebrating what you did that day some 2,000 years ago, that you're still bringing life to people in this very room. You're still saving souls. You're still transforming people and your heart is to continue to do so until you come again once and for all time in a day that is near and around the corner. So Father, we celebrate Easter today. We celebrate Resurrection Sunday. You are our God, you are our King, and you are worthy to be called Lord. Who do you say that I am? We say that you are God, that you are Jesus, the Son of the living God, and we love you, we praise you, and from this moment forward, we will serve you with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Put your hands together for those who may have prayed that prayer for the very first time. If you did pray that prayer for the very first time, I would love to give you some resources. In fact, we have a seven day start kit. If you'll text seven day start to the phone number 9700, we'll give you some resources, but we'd also love to join hands with you, answer any questions that you might have. Myself, other pastors and leaders will be up here at the front or at our next step station. Be sure to come say hello before you go. Also, if you're new to Journey Church, I'd just love to meet you. Come on up and say hello. Hope to see you next week. God bless you guys. Have a blessed Resurrection Sunday. To those of you in the Annex, thank you so much for joining us, as well as those of you who are online. Have a great day.